afternoon everybody and as I said it's uh, good to get the invite this afternoon for, for this session. I mean, a bit of background in a sense that when we, we talk about rank and file, the rank and file organisation which I'm representing this afternoon is the majority of people working in construction and uh, that arrived through a situation in 2011 where six major multinational companies tried to de-skill the industry and uh, the rank and file was born out of that and United Union is a kind of comparatively young union through the various mergers. But to date, in 2019, the 2011-12 campaign of the Rag to take on these six major companies, which we won, uh, was basically the greatest victory to date yet within that union. And sometimes when we look at trade unions and our own opinions of the trade union movement within the UK, some may say they're passive. But as far as the United Union is concerned, that was a major victory and it was down solely to the members of the Ragnar file, <coughs> not the constitutional committees of that union, but the Ragnar file who organised and took on these employers and won that great victory. But I mean, when, I, when I look at some of the people in the audience here today, many of us go back 30, 40 years ago and uh, I remember when I was in my 20s, we were carrying, campaigning against nuclear <coughs> Uh, disarmament and <coughs> at one of the plants. And one of the individuals who was working within there came up to me and says, David, you don't need to like the biscuits to work in the biscuit factory. And it's a thing that we should remember when we're taking this campaign of climate and climate change because myself personally, I've got many good colleagues who work in defence, work in <coughs> nuclear, work in petrochemical and the oil and gas industry. But they're not complicit by doing that. They're not complicit by doing that. They're there by various reasons and their life has taken them into working their jobs. And a lot of their jobs are highly paid, highly skilled, but also most of them are organised labour. And I think we should always remember when we come into this era of the climate, the effects of climate change and diversification, that we need to articulate the language into these workplaces and bring these people with us. Because the whole thing about diversification, if we're going to challenge the whole thing about climate, you have to make sure that we reinvigorate the debate. And in the earlier session that I was, was part, of, part of, I said, I think we've got a unique opportunity this time. It was difficult going back 30, 40 years ago for the key issues about nuclear and I mean, if you look at all the various conferences that's taken place since then, diversification has slipped off the agenda. If we look at the Clyde shipyards just now, they're still dependent on warships. The diversification motions have been passed year in, year out. The STUC and TUC have just been put somewhere and it's collecting dust. So therefore, we've got to make sure that when we discuss this now, and I'm hopeful, I'm more kind of invigorating in the sense that this issue is bringing in the arguments that people then take seriously that we've got to change how we approach the whole thing, but we've got to take these people within the various industries with us. Because we are in a, a political crisis also. And I make no apologies, I'm a Labour Party activist, I've been a member of the Labour Party for 40 years. And again, for the first time, I'm seeing the Labour Party, which I believe in. And although we don't want this to be a political issue, I'm saying quite clearly before I go on, is that I believe, again, we've got an opportunity in the forthcoming election. If we want to change society, if we want to have a green agenda, that we have to tuck in and support for these UK elections, the Labour Party and Jeremy Corbyn's and John McDonald and the rest of the Labour Party's ideals of a fairer society. And that comes all encompassing all the stuff we're talking here this afternoon. There's an absence of democracy, and we've seen that the loss of rights and representation. Brexit is a classic example. Okay? Trade union rights have been systematically eroded. The garden right to strike, the loss of workplace representation. And again, what have we got in the news this week? Postal workers trying to go on strike, but they're prevented 
by legislation. <coughs> legislation, by the way, is probably nowhere, seen nowhere else in Europe. Yet, the UK is supposed to be the mother of the trade union movement. So it's ironic that we have that. This is resulting, obviously, an overall loss in trade union membership. They may be 10, 20 years ago, we were talking about 13 million. We're now below 6 million. And the danger of that is that most of the affiliates have got their eggs in one basket. It's in local government health. But when you look at the private sector, that is low density. And therefore, when you get low density, it leads to insecurity. And actually talking to one of the colleagues there at, at lunchtime, even one of the major defence plants here in Edinburgh, prior, going back 10 years ago, there was probably about 100% maybe trade unionism, and now it's now down to 25%. And that just shows you the changes within UK as far as trade union, how we respond to certain things. So, a strengthening, when you have that, of the bureaucrats. You have the situation also that the figures recently, as far as industrial action is concerned, in response to the challenges for workers, is the lowest ever in the trade union movement. Okay, okay it may reflect <coughs> the lower numbers, but when you look at comparison, you, you see what is actually happening. So there's a passive trade union movement within here in the UK. There's an assault in, in the rights of protest, tighter immigration controls, the use of punitive fines and penalties for the exercise were previously well regarded as normal civil liberties are now being eroded. The tightening of property rights over the rights of access to protest, increased po policing, intrusive surveillance and the abuse of police powers. And we look at some of the, the programmes about face recognition <coughs> being implemented <coughs> without anybody knowing about it. And these are the kind of things that are shaping our society, dampening down the rights of protest, making people fearful to go out in the streets. But it is to see when Extinction Rebellion and others are trying to protest against that, but you've seen how hard the authorities begin to come down on. And we only need to look at the difference again between the UK and some of the countries in Europe, and France, the Yellow Vest, and various other things that we can use example in. So we have a lot of catching up today. The outcome, as I said earlier, the 12th general election is a chance to turn the tables, I believe. And I'm not going to accuse the pun Labour on that, but we <laughs> hopefully, and I say to people in here, of all mixed politics, green, yellow, whatever it is, to hold noses and think it through and encourage as many people as possible. Because I believe, genuinely believe, as far as the UK is concerned, this is the last opportunity for us to reverse the austerity that has damaged so many of our communities but also have an impact on climate if we don't get a government prepared to put in a new Green Deal. There's a social crisis there. Poverty is an instrument of political goals. Poverty wages. We see it all. And it's great you take your hat off to, to the little trade union members in McDonald's campaigning to try and reverse that. But the whole society and the gig economy is rife rife with low wages and exploitation. We need only need to go on the streets in Edinburgh and Glasgow and our major cities to see people in the streets. A housing crisis, lack of available affordable housing, the waning wealth and the health gap, all these things are adding to the people at the bottom of the pile. And it, it, it's just unacceptable in 2019. The salt in public and social services, universal credit is the new poor law. And as I say, the poverty public services has an impact on that. So we've got a, a climate crisis, but we've also got an economic crisis in how we deal with that. And there's a reluctance of some Western governments to face the reality. I mean, it's a... Uh, and I apologise for this part of the story in the sense that I was unaware of where I was coming to Fee Glasgow and I jumped in a taxi. But the perfect example of me, as I said to the group, was the taxi driver said, well, what are you, what are you going? And I explained. And the rhetoric for the ta taxi driver was the usual. Well, this is a lot of nonsense. Uh, we shouldn't be bothered with that. We are dealing with what we have today. We should be blaming the people in China and Indonesia and various other places. And that, to me, just epitomised the challenges what we face and everybody else faces and how we win the argument about what's happening to our planet. 
Because it's a consequence of the capitalist plunder of nature and human resources and labour power. And when we look at countries, okay, like uh, Brazil, etc., I've been told to to, to my So some ideas. A state-owned and democratically regulated energy and climate management company is a first. And I think we can see some people within the political circles in the UK talking about that. Integration of the above to ensure affordability, security and the environmentally responsible security of supply. Massive training programme for decent skilled employment in all areas of energy supply and efficiency. Full and democratic engagement for the rank and file organisations and communities in all areas of energy supply and production and affordability to govern the setting of all aspects of energy. But maybe, as I say, maybe I, I should have put myself on for two minutes, but I'll, I'll finish with this, colleagues. It's the challenge that uh, is facing us is not just here, it requires international solidarity, international solidarity and respect to our planet. And without that, We'll not have hope for the future generations. So hopefully the ideas we're exchanging here today, we can cascade them into the workplaces. But obviously we all recognise with some of the stuff that we've all discussed here today that there's a job of work to do. But I'm hopeful politically and the enthusiasm and particularly if we see the young people in the streets, I believe that this time we can win the argument and where we lost it perhaps in the nuclear debate, <coughs> this new issue about the planet, the crisis for the planet is there for us to bring everybody on board and hopefully we can get the right result. Okay, thank you.